Awesome. I will double check and make sure I'm live. Uh, so if you're watching live or if you're watching the recap, there'll be a 30 second delay. Sorry about that. I can hear an echo. Awesome. Um, and we have, oh, wow, uh, about 20 people already. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us on a changed, uh, or is it a change schedule or change of a schedule? Either way, uh, thanks for joining us on a different time. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, trying to wake up early, which means I have to go to bed early. So I moved this a uh, few hours before our usual schedule time, uh, thank you for making the time and joining us live. We'll be reading about the... I'm sharing the wrong slide, so let me move one slide up. Uh, I promise that wasn't intentional. Um, we'll be reading about the NFNet high-performance large-scale image recognition without normalization. That's a mouthful paper. Um, and we'll be going through an overall understanding of what's happening inside of this paper and why... Should it interest you? The reason why I'm covering this paper is uh, twofold. I had recently interviewed Jill, who, has in, who is a, one of the top ranked current Kaggle masters. He's almost a Kaggle grandmaster. And he had shared in his solution to the Birdcliff competition that they found this quite useful. So I was quite curious about reading this paper myself and for my own selfish reasons i decided to pick this paper up and that's why we'll be covering this let me put that link in the youtube chat if you go to uh, youtube and just search for ctds.show you will be able to find this interview on the top of the list so that's the origin story behind this paper since um, more sota papers have come out since i will not be taking a in-depth look into how higher accuracy is it for this paper, which is how we've been doing this paper reading groups in the past. Uh, if you're new here, welcome again. We'll be looking at what this paper produces as, and how are coordinates uh, without normalization performing better. As a homework, I'll probably also live stream myself uh, trying to apply this to audio data because the interview I mentioned had audio data in it and apparently these sets of neural networks performed really well so i'm also curious to try that out awesome uh let me continue in my slide once i find the right tab and if you're new here there have been a bunch of paper reading groups in the past you can find the recordings there how these start off uh i have had a common request to please also give a summary up front so let me do that first as you can probably judge from the title we're trying to assess how can convolutional neural network, so uh, not a transformer, just a coordinate for this case, performs without normalization. Inside of the paper, the authors take a look at batch normaliz normalization. That's a mouthful. Batch normalization. I got it the second time. And they uh, try to, first of all, appreciate it. Why does it work? Why was it used? so well and then uh, they try to pull it out of the equation and see how can they create a network that works better without it in the process they compare their paper against efficient nets and they outperform efficient nets so that's the benchmark that they're trying to beat in here and they achieve this by a few tricks that we'll be covering in this one hour uh, live stream so they account for the removal of batch normalization. They introduce something known as adaptive gradient clipping. And the last one is an incorrect point I had left in here. Here's an overall view of the architecture. Again, this is the summary. We'll, we'll go in depth into all of this. Uh, on the left, I think it's uh, a diff. So both, between both of these, these are two different layers that you can expect. One has average pooling included in it, and the other one does not. As you can see, this is quite similar to what you'd expect inside of a ResNet architecture, minus 
the batch norm layer. So I, li I let you look at this before we move back and start reading or start going through in depth. Beta and alpha don't have to make sense to you. It's again a new, let's say, parameter that has been introduced here. Uh, it's again to account for when you remove batch normalization, what does happen? And if you pay close attention, everything else would more or less look, look the same here. So this is the architectural block that you can expect. Awesome. So that was a very quick TikTok timed summary. Uh, I promise I'm not starting a TikTok. I just want you to give the summary up front. And uh, we'll start the reading group with one announcement. As you know, at Bates and Bices, we really care about the community a lot. And let me share this link in the chat. We're hosting a blogathon, and this is solely for you all, uh, to the people listening or rewatching the recap. This is uh, going to run from 1st of June to 14th of June. So you still have about, I'd say, more than a week uh, to get your submissions in. What is this? Uh, we want you to get started in your blogging journey or to push you further in your journey. And for that purpose, we are also willing to give you our money in the form of CUDA power and merch. So if you want to earn some compute credits or WNB merchandise, which I think both, both are equally cool, you're welcome to send in your submissions. Take a look at this link and you can uh, understand how you can get started. It's open to any topic of interest to you. You can potentially also do the suggested homework from this live stream. I always suggest a few ideas at the end of the live stream that you can get started with. And uh, those will be also great submissions in my mind. I might be a bit biased and you might get better scores. <laughs> we never know. Um, or you can write on, on any topic of your interest. There's no rules really. Just uh, please be mindful that you don't plagiarize and you don't... Um... I think that's the only rule. <laughs> Please don't, please don't copy paste someone else's work. Uh, have fun and send in any blogs you might have. In return, uh, we will definitely be happy to share your book further. Or if it's uh, quite good and if you end up enjoying it, uh, we'll also be sending some prizes to winners. So if you want our money, please, uh, this is a good chance to get started with writing. So here's the agenda for today. And now I'll be slowing things down and not <laughs> rushing through the entire overview in one second. Um, we'll be looking at the prerequisites because there are a few in this paper. I'll be giving the overview of the paper first, and then we'll go into a thorough reading of the paper, followed by an overview of the architecture. And one really cool thing that the authors have included in this paper, uh, which as I watched Yannick's video just before this live stream, he also said, the authors have shared what didn't work really well for them on experiments that had harmful effects. It's just one page, but it was a really cool read. And we'll also go through that. After that, you'll get some ideas on what you can potentially write about. So I want to mention another incredible resource that I had used today. And the reason, and the reason it's not linked here is uh, it's easier if I just show you how to find it. So I'll just go to YouTube and search for Yannick Kilcher NFNet. And I highly encourage everyone to check this video out either before watching this or after watching this. I always read the paper by myself. And after that, I end up watching Yannick's videos. He's an absolutely incredible. Uh, I'm trying to find the right word. He's not just a content creator because it's, it's really uh, quite depth filled content. So Yannick's video is also an absolute incredible resource that I would recommend everyone to check out. I have learned a lot from that video and I'll probably be using a lot of things that he taught in that. You can also check out the official repository for uh, the paper's implementation. It's in JAX. And if you're new to JAX, we have been doing a JAX series that you all can learn from. So uh, <laughs> more, more stuff that I can promote you all <laughs> to watch or learn. Uh, the better, right? 
and i would also mention the interview where i first learned of this um network so now let's start with uh, the overview of the paper the authors address that there are some issues with batch normalization and uh, these include there's a slight memory overhead uh, these usually causes shift when you're working with train and test so they first uh, mentioned why batch normalization is really helpful uh, does anyone want to take a job at this why do we use batch normalization i'll give everyone a few seconds to answer if not i'll continue myself um so the question is why do we use batch normalization um okay before i embarrass myself further i'll give the answer it's to stabilize the training with really deep networks when you uh, batch norm it's a sort of a chicken egg situation but to create a uh, very deep networks you need to add normalization for some reason that the original paper didn't cite correctly or didn't share correctly it was corrected afterwards batch normalization works really well inside of a very deep neural network patch normalization helps create a properly normalized distribution yanik had drawn this in his video so i'll copy his style and let me share my screen again and draw this somewhere in my microsoft one note share screen select one note zoom in somewhere pick up my pen so inside of a network uh, you can assume that whatever parameters are being passed eventually get distorted and ideally you want these normalized so with batch norm you will make this nice and normalized around the origin of the axis uh, which is what normalization is supposed to do uh, again i learned this from yanik's video so i'm directly sharing what he said in the video please do check that video out and his channel as well after that um so that's that's what batch normalization does and when you start removing it you have to of course account for the fact that nothing else is taking care of this another concept that we absolutely need to know before we start reading the paper is what is gradient clipping so hopefully i can get one answer this time if anyone wants to take a job uh, what is gradient clipping uh i missed nikhil nair's answer from for why do we use batch normalization he says it's to speed up training um it's mostly to stabilize it as well in in some ways if you remove batch normalization you could speed up your training but you'll also not be able to train the deep model awesome nikhil uh, has another answer thanks nikhil uh and i hope everyone else is as interactive as nikhil <laughs> for my sakes guys i'm just in a room speaking to a screen and this doesn't feel as interactive please <laughs> help me out a bit uh, nikhil says uh, it's to curve vanishing gradient problem or exploding gradient awesome uh, so it's it's the latter nikhil it's just to curve the exploding gradient problem as i understand let me share my screen and again uh, elaborate on this So as you go about training a model there are two problems like nikhil pointed out one of them is let me write this somewhere 
it's called vanishing gradients i'm so happy of the fact that my writing handwriting has improved a bit now um vanishing gradient happens when your gradients start to approach zero or they start to disappear inside the layers this leads to a problem where everything eventually becomes zero and your model doesn't get trained right because everything inside the model is just now zeros the other problem is when you have gradients and as you are updating these with backprop let's say you get a really huge um update which causes this to go towards infinity this is known as exploding gradients because they are quite literally uh exploding so to deal with this we do something known as gradient clipping which involves let's say um your previous gradient was 0.1 and the next one somehow goes to or let's say it's 0.01 and somehow your model tells you the next one should be 10 okay you 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 go there and you say maybe you should take it easy and you clip this at point 1 so if it suggests a value larger than this the value just gets clipped at that so you can imagine the graph to be somewhat like a relu graph sorry not not like a relu it's more of a constant so if the value goes to greater than value which you want to clip this at the gradient gets set to this value so that's gradient clipping let me see if there is anything else i want to mention and um yep there's one small question uh, that i have has anyone else heard of nf resnet and i'm just curious if you have any vague idea about the difference between nf resnet and nfnet are they the same thing or are they different i didn't get an answer so i'll continue by myself um they are different <laughs> they're not the same um and the nf resnet paper as i understand came out before nfnet we won't be covering that today you're welcome to check that out if you want uh, i wanted to get the point across that no these are not the same uh these are different papers and models that came out different times with that uh, we are ready to go into reading the paper so three things again that we need to know uh, what is batch norm what are skip connections and what is gradient clipping um i'll just wait to check if there are any questions around this i'll again encourage everyone to write them in the chat anywhere so i'll wait for 10 seconds before moving on uh if anyone has any questions now is a good time Awesome. I don't see any questions, so I'll continue as promised. Uh, let me share back. Not this. Sorry. Uh, I want to share one note so that I can annotate it. I got the right one this time. Awesome. So now we'll be going through the paper. Uh, not word by word. I usually here's how I do this. I read the paper ahead of time. If you're new here. and i just highlight the parts that i think are interesting and worth your time so inside a 30 minute summary uh things you should absolutely know those are the bits i cover here so let's start with the graph on the right they are claiming about the fact that our nfnet 
f1 model which would be this one achieves comparable accuracy to efficient at b7 while being 8.7 times faster to train so imagine top one accuracy is on the y axis as you can see it's slightly larger i would say no it looks like it's slightly larger and um as you can see the training latency so per seconds per step on tpu v3 with an incredible batch size of 32 um is much smaller so the model iterates through this in about 0.2 seconds i'd like to say and here's it about here it's about 1.4 times 1.4 seconds and then they say our nfnet f5 model has similar latency to bnet sorry b7 but has a sota top one accuracy so they're really comparing their model against efficient net which uh, again if you're getting confused the blue line are the efficient net family of models remember whenever um, authors work on a convolutional network they really try to scale their models up how do they do that let me scroll down a bit and see if there's a table highlighting this which there is so for this case uh, this table shows the family depths drop rates and input resolution as you can see as you go deeper in the model uh, the number of layers increases the depth increases so the authors always have a tiny version of the model a big version mod of the model and so nowadays there's an excel version of the model too those are the ones being compared here and that's why you have efficient at b2 blah 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 b7 same for this f0 up till f5 So that's what uh, is an outcome of this. Now they start by talking about uh, batch normalization and why is it important. Without normalization, they say these models do not match the test accuracies of best batch normalized networks. And they're talking about ResNets. In this work, they develop something known as an adaptive gradient clipping, which takes care of these instabilities and design a significantly improved class of normalizer free resonates and the normalizer that they're getting rid of is batch normalization and then they again say it's much faster and is so tough after this they talk about uh, why was batch normalization introduced and how is it key to all of the models uh, for a few years and after that, they talk about, let me switch, switch colors here. I think this should be in red. I can't select red, so let's, let's make do with pink. After that, they talk about three significant practical disadvantage of batch normalization. So uh, for some reason, they really want to uh, be critical about batch normalization and that's what they will be removing later on. It is surprisingly expensive, computationally primitive, and there's a memory overhead when you're trying batch normalization. As a homework, you could uh, train or create a really vanilla model. Just run it on your CPU. Um, you could also write about this. So just run it on your CPU, uh, add a few layers of batch normalization, benchmark it, <laughs> benchmark it without the BN layer. Accuracy doesn't matter, uh, it's just to prove the fact that there's a memory overhead and you can see for yourself, you'll observe that. I saw Nikhil ask a question about the nomenclature uh, of F1 to F5. I think I've already answered that. Please let me know if I didn't. And this increases the time required to evaluate the gradient in some networks. Second, so that was just the first disadvantage. 
it introduces a discrepancy between the behavior of model during training and at inference. Since there are some hyperparameters that need to be tuned. Third, it breaks the independence between training examples in the mini batch. And then they talk about how this actually negatively affects the model. And uh, Yannick actually explains how this could cause leakage. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you to watch that video. But uh, if you don't set up your validation splits correctly, uh, you could have a data leakage issue and you could have very accurate models that could be potentially dangerous. Nikhil is saying, thanks for explaining um, the nomenclature. You, you're welcome, Nikhil. Uh, so, and I missed another question. Does NF... Resonate have residual blocks? I believe so, yes. So let me jump ahead to what I need to cover next. No, I have nothing in the left column. Here they summarize their main contributions. Again, I've already spoken about this, but I'll keep repeating these as they come up. They propose adaptive gradient clipping, which clips gradient based on unit-wise ratio of gradient norms to parameter norms. I didn't understand any bit of this sentence. And if you don't, uh, I said that to help make you feel better. If you do, uh, let me know. But I had to actually watch Yannick's video and just uh, read the equation a few times to understand this. Then the design of family of NF ResNets called NFNets, con conveniently. And then they talk about, again, these how faster these are to train. And uh, that the fact that they are more accurate. Another homework, you could compare these against uh, some other model that is faster to train for your data set and see how it fares. Again, I keep giving these ideas as experiments to have fun with. If you have your own ideas, you're welcome to run these. I just, I just leave them out there so that you can potentially try something. The third contribution that the authors have, NFNets achieve substantially higher validation accuracies than batch normalization when fine tuning on ImageNet after pre-training on a large private data set of 300 million labeled images. So the authors have a secretive data, sets, uh, data set that has about 300 million labeled images and that helps them uh, even further their model accuracy. So after this they help you understand what past normalization is. And uh, I'll just be reading the bold headlines here and giving a bit of fluff. So batch normalization downscales the residual branch. I'm trying to see if I should highlight anything. I think this explains itself. And this eliminates a mean shift. What do they mean by this? So when you are using, uh, let's say, ReLU from here, since ReLU has a graph like so, and ReLU basically means if x is greater than 0, x is equal to x, otherwise 0. Um, since this has this nature, of being slightly positive or always positive. This causes a mean shift in the parameters and results in activations that have a non-zero mean. So batch normalization takes care of this. It is a regularizer. <laughs> and as, as I explained earlier, inside of the layers, it causes a fix in the distribution and thereby it actually allows a large batch training. In theory, this happens because it smoothens the loss landscape. And this allows you to have a higher learning rate. 
<laughs> even because of all of these they really want to remove bash normalization because of the first three critical issues that they had raised about it just just remember that so the reason they talk about what bash normalization does is because they want to account for those changes and actually take care of this so the first thing that they do they employ a residual block of the form this which i had to read a few times to understand so let's take a look at it again from the architectural image because i found that was easier i should have just scrolled to the 22nd page or somewhere like that to understand it <laughs> and i wouldn't have been so confused here we go so the flow of activation or data inside the model happens like so um beta comes before the block alpha is the value that accounts for what's coming out of the block and then this goes over to a skip connection like so on the right and on the left all of this gets accounted for and moves on to the next layer so now if i scroll back here f denotes the current layer so whatever is happening happening inside of the convolutional block i plus 1 is the next layer h i is actually the inputs to the ith layer and alpha and beta are, let's say just uh, parameters or scalars that help you adjust this and then they give a bit of more uh, definition around how this works and how it helps with the mean shift i'm going to skip that because if uh, you want to get an overview of the architecture i think this is good enough i'm just checking for questions i don't see any so i'll keep kind keep going um next thing they talk about is adaptive gradient clipping for making the batch sizes larger so uh i've already talked about gradient clipping and let me explain this by the graph so you really want larger batch sizes to train a model faster and um sorry i'll be looking towards the right now because i've lost power and my monitor does not have backup since i gave preference to my <laughs> deep learning rig and not the monitor i have my priorities and i'm sorry they're like this i'll be looking here and not here um so if you take a look at the graph on the right you can see that with ab about a batch of 2048 the nf resnet um plateaus with performance am i looking at the right graph yes i think so but when they introduce a clipping threshold yeah i i was worried i'm i'm not explaining this correctly introducing the clipping threshold actually fixes this sorry about that so when they do that as you can see it allows them to set the batch sizes to even larger values so with that for a resnet 50 they are able to set larger batch larger batch sizes and keep the accuracy going further so inside of adaptive gradient clipping uh you can think of this as something that's um being calculated unit wise uh, throughout the model and it helps um increasing the batch batch size so usually in gradient clipping as i was pointing out earlier and now let me look at the camera <laughs> um with gradient clipping you usually uh, clip based on a constant here it's being changed throughout the training of the model and that helps you use much larger batch sizes like i'd shown in the graph 
after that they do a bunch of ablations around why agc is helpful how that works i'm going to skip those because i just wanted to give a brief overview of this I'm just skimming to see if I want to highlight anything. Um, one critical feedback that um, Yannick had here is the authors are using Dropout. And Dropout uh, is somewhat similar to batch norm in the sense that it changes um, the training and test. Uh, it, it changes how training and testing is being performed since you perform dropout while you're training your model. So Yannick's uh, feedback, again, I'm, I'm just quoting his video, was the authors claim that all of these approaches we just looked at, AGC um, and the other things help the model, but we can't really pinpoint it to one fact because we are also tweaking other things here. So he uh, wanted to introduce just one thing. One paper that actually does compare things individually is the Connex paper. Uh, I had actually covered that in our reading group, so you can check out the recording. Should be in the same playlist, um, but that's one of the papers where the author actually credit each individual contribution to different things that they add. Um, again, I'll, I'll point out two things uh, before this, they were talking about how they made training uh, perform better on TPUs uh, by changing a few things. I think you can read through those uh, thing worth highlighting is they changed the depth scaling pattern for ResNets. And after that, Sorry, I'm still scrolling through. Give me one second, I have this pop-up coming. Sorry about that, let me reshare my screen. I'm really sorry about that. I had to disconnect my monitor uh, since that pop-up wasn't going away. Sorry about that. And I have to join again. Um, let me share my screen. And make sure it's the uh, right notebook. Sorry about that again. I can now zoom out since I'm back on my monitor. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so they make two changes to the model backbone. Uh, they note that the default depth for ResNets involves non-uniformly increasing the number of layers. And they discover that this strategy is suboptimal. They explored several choices for the backbone for the smallest model. And they basically settled on this layer after experimenting a bit. They also reconsider the default width pattern where the first stage has 256 channels. They change it to like so. And this is designed uh, to increase capacity in the third stage 
third stage of again uh, the model blocks while slightly reducing capacity in the fourth stage final change that they include is to establish a scaling strategy to produce model variants at different compute budgets um i think that's all i wanted to highlight here let's continue further i won't go into much depth here one thing i want to point out here is um f0 compared against all of these is still quite larger and it still performs or the training time is much faster um i think this should be shorter for this one no so it's it's it appears it's not shorter compared to b0 interesting hmm i'm getting confused myself now the accuracy is definitely higher which is good but the training time is slightly more um yep that is consistent throughout i assume uh, the throughput was higher in the first graph sorry i'm getting confused myself i should i should i'll come back and take a look at this and uh, probably mention it in the comments i don't want to spend more time here but from this graph here's what i understand and uh, if anyone in the live chat can correct me uh, nfnet is taking slightly longer than efficient nets to train um still more accurate and it has more parameters but i'm confused uh, if i'm reading this in the correct way i think i am but i just want to double check if anyone wants to comment so awesome. let's continue further mute myself i don't want to hear an echo sorry about that um i am a bit yeah. all over the place today since my monitor isn't behaving nicely um after that they also share transfer top one accuracy i'll skip this because uh, again this is quite straightforward you can read through all of these to give you the summary they evaluate transfer learning and they don't give much detail here uh but they just give you an overview of how this performs against a large data set of 300 million labeled images what happens when they pre train on this and transfer to imagenet so to conclude this is the first time image recognition models without normalization can not only match accuracy of best batch normalized models but also substantially exceed them while being faster to train can okay, i I'm, i'm a bit confused about this claim since the training time here appears to be slightly larger but i assume they converge faster maybe that's why that's the case sorry for adding to to some confusion they introduce adaptive gradient clipping i'll come back to my previous confusion and answer them uh, i don't want to waste everyone's time by let's struggle with that they also introduce adaptive gradient clipping which helps stabilize large batch training and they show that normalizer free models are better suited to fine tuning after pre training on very large scale data sets after this i want to highlight a few more things here um no i don't want to highlight anything from here one thing that i found quite interesting was um nfnet 4 plus f4 plus and f4 take about 3.7k and 1.86k tpu v3 core days and this is again for the extra data for large scale pre training uh, but as i found this uh, quite fascinating that they're training on such a large data set with 
so much time being accounted for and it was stained on 32 devices with a batch size of 32 per device and they they go into depth of how they are sinking the gradients all those things and they also talk about how it takes to train these on a v100 gpu um as i understand this paper came out in 2021 so uh, a100 was the faster at that time but still v100 is what's most commonly used so they did benchmark on that which is good to see after this they talk about image augmentation which i'll again skip they talk about sam which is sharpness aware minimization again you can read through this if you want i'm just giving you the meaty bits one cool thing that i want to point out after this is not the model details it is not the model overview not the agc round sides it's a negative results so this was a really cool section even yanik pointed this out that they talk about negative results and they say about what all strategies did they develop with or did they experiment with and they did try out the placement of squeeze and excitement layers and more and they talk about what all was helpful what all didn't work effectively here again it's quite straightforward to read uh, but i just wanted to point it out because most of us stop reading after the citation start to show up do scroll to the bottom and check out the negative results when you get to it awesome so that was mostly what i wanted to cover in this overview i'll leave the last few minutes for any questions and in the meantime i'll continue with my slide deck if you have any questions please now is the best time to ask them in the meantime i'll give everyone some suggested homework to again try for a blogathon and as a reminder please uh, feel free to tag me or tag weights and biases whenever you share any of this uh or any any blog for that matter that you write i would rather encourage you to share it uh, and participate in the blogathon uh best case we feature your blog uh, it reaches a few thousand people few hundred thousand people potentially and we send you some compute credits so one of the homeworks i have is to try this model on audio data set again i might cover this myself on um chai time data science sometime next week if i get the chance to live stream or i'll probably do a code walk through maybe you could write about i'll do it depending on my bandwidth but i'm not sure right now you could do a code walk through of either the jax implementation or pytorch code pytorch code is available in tim which is pytorch image models if you're not familiar it's an absolutely incredible framework that everyone pretty much uses in the pytorch world if you don't uh, just look up pytorch image models and this has almost the entirety of computer vision models that you probably ever need in pytorch i would encourage you to compare nfnet versus efficientnet versus nfresnet on a problem that you are working on and then again uh, consider writing about it in the blogathon with that let me stop sharing my screen and check if there are any questions i'll wait a few minutes a few seconds sorry before wrapping up awesome um i believe there are no further questions so that means we can wrap up here um thanks everyone for joining uh, again consider writing about this consider joining the future reading groups and uh, if you have any questions please feel free to leave a comment on the video that you are watching right now i will get back and answer the question that i had about why is the training time larger and it still trains faster than the other models i assume it's because these converge faster but i will double check and answer that Thank you so much again for joining these happen every month uh, and in between you might also want to join any other community workshop that we are hosting right now we are hosting the blogathon 
we also have a few other ideas planned down the down the pipeline so keep an eye out for that thanks again for joining and i'll see you in one of our uh, workshops or live streams